All right, well, hi everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to visit Hatch. I've, I've known Zach and have been aware of Hatch for probably about five years now. And I um, was talking earlier about just how much you all have going on and how much Norfolk itself has to offer. So it seems like you all are in the right place at the right time. And uh, I'm thankful to be able to come and speak. So my background is I went to Old Dominion, both for undergraduate and graduate school. And then I've spent my whole career, about the last six and a half years, on Hawaii Island. And uh, my goal with that is was to develop some healthcare infrastructure where Hawaii, for the most part, is a second world type place. You know, it's very different from the rest of the United States. And um, we've got huge, huge challenges in terms of sustainability of the healthcare system. And so through that, um, I've had to do a lot of talking to both well, all, actually all county, um, state, and then the federal government, um, trying to get the resources we need. Um, also, I've had a few roles in a few different startups. So I've worked uh, in lobbying efforts on behalf of those startups as well. Uh, but by trade, I'm actually a physical therapist. So what we want to cover today, we want to talk about why startups might need to lobby in the first place. Um, Differentiate between what's a professional lobbyist versus somebody who just lobbies. What's the difference between those two categories? Um, who can actually lobby and how much lobbying can they do? And that becomes really, really important, especially if you're a nonprofit. So if you're a 501 versus a 506 versus a private company, there's different rules in terms of how much money you can spend lobbying, how much time you're allowed to spend. But for the private sector, generally, it's pretty easy. There's, there's not many restrictions. Um, private sectors do spend a lot of money lobbying, and they're not capped like nonprofit businesses. So first slide here. Um, as operational definitions, let's define a lobbyist as someone who actually gets paid to lobby, somebody who makes a living trying to influence legislators at the state or federal level versus just plain lobbying, probably what most people outside of, of career lobbying or being a lobbyist will do. Um, most of us will engage in lobbying probably through a conference that's in DC, and by the way, there's some bills potentially on the table that maybe would benefit our industry. So most people will engage more in informal lobbying. So technically, we want to figure out who is actually a lobbyist. Who is a paid lobbyist? You have to be all three of these things. So for tax purposes and in terms of, of staying good with the IRS and whether or not you need to register as a lobbyist, these are the three questions you have to ask yourself. If you are going to DC or to Richmond here and you're making over $3,000 within three months, if you're getting uh, repeat contracts from different businesses that want you to lobby for them, and if you spend more than 20% of your time lobbying, if you're all three of those things, you are a lobbyist. So if you're one and two but not three, you're not a lobbyist. It's not an and or, it's just an and. So if you are technically a lobbyist, as far as the IRS is concerned, then you have to fill, fill out a lobby disclosure form with the IRS and that lets them know that that's how you make a living and there's certain tax brackets associated with that. So according to the IRS website where you find the lobbying disclosure form, this was the definition they gave of lobbying. Very simply put, it's a very broad definition that we can sum up by saying, if you are trying to influence legislators or their staff, you are lobbying. Whether that's going to their office whether that's informally out on the streets trying to influence the public uh, with picket signs, things like that, knowing that politicians are going to be influenced by their constituent base. All that is lobbying. So why do we need lobbyists? And why do we need lobbying? If you ask a professional lobbyist, what they'll tell you is this, that government officials are not experts in everything. In fact, most of them have had careers in a very defined field and now are having to 
vote on legislation that affects pretty much every industry. So, because our senators or house reps have limited amounts of staff, limited amounts of time, um, lobbyists and lobbying can serve to inform them what the needs of the general public and specific industries are. So, also, professional lobbyists represent people that sometimes have a hard time representing themselves. So think about it like this. If you have a new startup group and you invent some technology that has never existed before and you're not sure whether or not laws need to change to accommodate your product, it might be easier just to hire a lobbyist who already has existing relationships with people in Richmond and D.C. Um, that way, you can spend your time doing whatever you have to do for your product or service cycle. Leave the lobbying to someone else that does it full time. So, I wanted to include a slide talking about sort of the scope of what you can expect to accomplish through lobbying. Because of past scandals and you know everyone's heard the word Jack or the name Jack Abramoff, uh, people have these wild ideas about what you can and can't accomplish through lobbying. But basically, what you probably won't accomplish through lobbying, no matter how much money, no matter how much effort you put into it, is you will not convince a politician to do something that is against the, the need of its constituent base, so of its voting base. Uh, I've gotten a lot of questions before about, well, what about um, some of these more recent scandals with uh, you know, foreign companies lobbying and investing a lot of money in D.C.? Well, because we have elected officials, um, if those people want to stay in office, they need to serve their constituents first. And I believe, for the most part, most politicians do that pretty well. If you go and lobby, you want to have very specific ways of asking the legislator to act on your behalf. So for instance, um, you don't want to go talk to a senator and just rattle off a bunch of things that you wish would or would not be legal. You need to, to couch what you're asking for into a, a bill or a motion that's already on the floor. Because otherwise, senators and house reps don't really have a way to help you. Um, generally what you're most successful at is if there is a bill that's already on the floor of the Senate or the House and there are a few provisions within that bill that would be you know, better or worse for your industry, you need to ask that rep to vote on specific provisions within the bill. And then that is a mechanism of action to which they can actually help you with. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my past history with lobbying. Um, I was on the State Board of Directors with the March of Dimes Birth Defects Foundation um, here in Virginia for a number of years, uh, from 2002 up until about 2010. And so back in 2002, March of Dimes research uh, showed that you know, women that are exposed to secondhand smoke are much more likely to give birth to babies prematurely or with certain birth defects. So then we started looking at how are women most often exposed to secondhand smoke? And we found that uh, waitresses and bartenders really are very often exposed to secondhand smoke. And it's putting women in this very unfair position to where when they get pregnant, should they quit their job so they're not exposed to the smoke? And if they do so, will they lose their insurance? Or can we just ban smoking in restaurants and have you know, separate smoking areas that have their own ventilation where people can choose to go into those rooms, you know, have people smoke outside, things like that. So in 2002, we started introducing um, different bills to the, the Virginia State Assembly. Um, we didn't get the bill passed until 2009. And this picture right here is uh, Governor Tim Kaine, who was a governor and, of course, now is a senator running as Hillary's VP. Um, but Tim Kaine was very helpful, helped us to pass that bill. Um, in 2010, I started a company with a co-founder named Keith um, in the telehealth space or providing physical therapy services uh, through mobile apps. We made this technology for people in rural areas that do not have access to physical therapy, as well as countries where the profession of physical therapy doesn't exist. So we produced the first treatment-specific app 
on Apple Store back in 2010, had a questionnaire that asked people about back pain. And um, at the time, there was a lot of questions about, okay, what are the laws regarding direct-to-consumer healthcare products? And there wasn't a lot of laws out there uh, because it was such a new technology. So in Hawaii, on two of our islands, physical therapy doesn't exist. Um, residents of those islands a lot of times have to catch a flight to another island if they want to work on you know, their balance or, or their back pain. So we produced apps that we wanted to introduce to these islands that people could use to treat themselves autonomously because it was unrealistic for someone with back pain to get on a plane, fly to a different island just for physical therapy. So we went and spoke with the Hawaii State Senate and told them that, you know, we've got these rural areas without access to physical therapy. We've got a solution that's free that we can roll out today. We got unanimous support there. That was a pretty easy sell. And then recently, because of my experience with iRehab, uh, I was asked by uh, U.S. Senator Brian Schatz, who's from Hawaii, and his policy advisors uh, to, to help them out with some of the verbiage regarding the Connect for Health Act, which is a federal bill that's currently on the Senate floor. Um, it's currently in a subcommittee, so we're not sure yet if and when it will get passed. But the idea behind that is that doctors and physical therapists should get reimbursed for time they spend with patients online. So let's say you have somebody from way, way up in Appalachia who might need to come see a specialist down here in Norfolk where there's, there's wonderful healthcare. Maybe that person only wants to ask the specialist a question or two. Should they really get in their car and drive all the way down here just to talk to that doctor? And what if they miss their appointment um, after traveling for hours? That would really be a shame. So if that specialist could get reimbursed for their time, it might be a whole lot easier for that specialist just to connect um, with the patient online and then decide what further action needs to take place. So I went to DC, lobbied for that. We got a lot of bipartisan support and are expecting the bill to pass at some point this year. And then uh, this is me and then a few other members of the Community Health Center Network in Hawaii where um, in the orange there, that's our Senator Maisie Hirono, also a U.S. Senator. And Maisie sponsored a bill um, to help out with the Veterans Administration. Probably everyone in this room is pretty familiar with some of the issues that have faced the VA hospitals in the past, trying to get patients in in a timely manner and whatnot. Well, one of the provisions within this bill is that patients of the VA system can go outside the VA system. They can go to other clinics see other specialists until the VA has the right amount of staff and, and really um, has the ability to accommodate appointments quickly. So a lot of times they get asked, you know, gee, do people really lobby? Do industries really lobby outside of maybe oil and natural gas and pharmaceuticals? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Where you see here, these are some really, really big numbers on the board of what different industries spend across the board. Uh, the biggest single private company in terms of lobbying dollars is actually Google. Google spends more than any one other individual company. But yeah, you can see across the board, I mean, uh, even uh, even people that work for the government lobby go to DC and spend a lot of time and efforts trying to influence legislators. Uh, but I wanted to talk about issues that are probably more familiar to you all. And of course, we couldn't talk about lobbying without talking about Uber. <laughs> so everyone's very familiar with the challenges Uber faces, where in certain states, in certain cities, should they have to comply with the same rules as the taxi cab companies? Of course, the taxi companies say yes. They say Uber's dangerous. We don't know who these people are. Uh, we don't know what type of insurance they have or if their insurance covers a passenger in the case of an accident. There's all these issues. And then Uber comes back and says, well, you know, we're doing a good thing. We're providing uh, ingenuity that no one else has. Um, taking a cab is a miserable experience. And through Uber and technologies like Lyft, um, anyone can have a job almost instantaneously. And so they're coming back at the legislators with that. And now the legislators have to figure this out 
know, what is more valuable to the community and what creates uh, the most amount of public safety. And so, um, Uber spends quite a bit of time and money in Washington. They have an office there dedicated towards influencing legislation. Um, I wanted to talk about an example of unsuccessful startup lobbying. So, if you're a startup, don't do what these folks do. Um, they've had a really tough time. Good company, good idea, but lobbying efforts have been really confusing. So, this company, Elio Motors, in 2009, came up with this idea that you can make these very small three-wheeled cars. You can sell them for $6,800 to get 84 miles to the gallon. So it's like, wow, you know, anyone can afford to own a car. You know, these are cheap cars that anyone can afford. So that was their mission. But the problem is, what is this thing? Um, if you grew up in the 80s and early 90s, you probably remember three-wheeled ATVs, and then all of a sudden they're nowhere to be found. You know, pretty much every state said these things are dangerous, they flip over. So there's very strict laws in the books about three-wheeled motorcycles. So then the question becomes, well, what is this? Um, is this a motorcycle? Is it a car? What kind of law should govern it? And the problem Elios ran into is they said, yes, we want to be considered a motorcycle when it comes to emission standards. So because motorcycles are more fuel efficient, the EPA doesn't require them to build in technology like cars do, like catalytic converters, things that um, you know control carbon output. Because they figure, well, you know, motorcycles they're so small, even if they pollute more per cubic liter of, of smog, it, it's still such a small amount, not a big deal. So Elio wants to be a motorcycle there, but they don't want to be a motorcycle when it comes to safety, because if they're considered a motorcycle, then occupants of the vehicle have to wear helmets. And can you imagine driving around kind of a goofy looking car already wearing a helmet? Probably a pretty hard sales pitch to most consumers. And so I think where they've gone wrong is they've confused the legislators, where the legislators go, wait, so you want to be a motorcycle on one end, but you want to be considered a car on a different end. And um, it's hard for legislators to come up with a course of action to help them around sort of that level of confusion. So as a result, unfortunately, LEO is probably still a few years away from being able to actually get their products to market if they ever are in general. So I wanted to really paint the picture um, as to how much startup lobbying actually goes on. So what I did is I just went on the Huffington Post website and I just typed in startup lobbying and just pulled up all these different headlines only from 2015. So you can see where, you know, why would Snapchat need to lobby? Why would Yelp? Um, generally the answer for, for startups, especially in the social media space, revolves around what data can you take from people? How do you protect that data? How do you protect your customers? And so groups like Snapchat have to talk to their legislators and everyone has to get on the same page about you know what is reasonable and what is not moving forward. So I wanted to talk about, we talked about Elio Motors and how they've had a hard time lobbying because they've come up with a, a pretty confusing pitch. Um, I wanted to talk about a really, really good example of a startup that's lobbied incredibly well and through their startup efforts um, have been able to, to really move their ideas forward. And I don't think Anyone lobbies as well as Elon Musk and his companies. So whether it's SpaceX, Tesla, SolarCity, they've done a tremendous job convincing legislators um, to allow them to bring their products to the market. So we've all heard about Tesla, how they had a hard time with cars catching on fire. And you know, Tesla, as well as other electric vehicles, there's a lot of issues around them. You know, do they pay gasoline tax? Of course they don't. Um, are electric cars safe? What happens when they get into an accident? Um, and what should we do about that? What should the laws be? So Elon's smart that he knew he had issues with cars catching on fire, um, as any new technology will have potential issues. So Tesla had to create the safest car that um, had ever been tested, which they successfully did. So then. When they're lobbying, they can say, yes, you know, we've had a few vehicles catch on fire, but look, according to crash tests, we've developed the safest vehicle on the market. Um, 
And Elon's also talked about how um, he's developing free technology infrastructure to go along with the cars, so fuel grids, things like that. Uh, Elon Musk has been really successful in, in helping to kind of embarrass other government contractors to win contracts for SpaceX. So um, a while ago, Lockheed and Boeing merged. Um, they became this, the same parent company to take on government contracts. And it was Elon Musk and SpaceX that pointed out that since they merged, there's no longer competition. And now the government is paying um, hugely for the fact that there's no competition. So his lobbying pitch that became very public was, you know, SpaceX can save your taxpayers money. Um, you know, these other guys are taking advantage of the government. And so one thing that they actually pointed out when SpaceX was lobbying was some of the margins of Lockheed and Boeing. So they, they had 177,000% margin on some of the parts that they were selling to government. So another thing that I think Elon Musk companies have done well is they provide a lot of jobs in the US. So Tesla, SpaceX, SolarCity, all their headquarters and factories for the most part are in California. So of course now they're building their new uh, battery gigafactory out in Nevada. But they're not subbing out jobs overseas. So if you're a California state legislator and you go, wow, you know, they're providing thousands and thousands of jobs, over 30,000 jobs to our community, you're more incentivized to keep them in your district and keep them happy. So another thing that I, I think SpaceX in particular has done well um, is they've really created a lot of hope and a lot of excitement. So obviously not any of us can go just launch rockets. Um, imagine all the different laws and all the different agencies you would have to speak to to actually launch something in space. But they've done a good job of convincing legislators of sort of the, the romanticism of the space industry and what the space industry used to be in the 70s. And um, as a whole, have been allowed to really go forward with with all of their projects. So I wanted to talk about next, how is the Congress actually structured? Um, I feel like a lot of times people don't really know, you know how the Congress works um, and how that works in relation to the executive branch. So Congress is made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, House reps, we have 435 total. That's determined by the population of your state. Where in the Senate, on the next slide, each state gets two senators. So that's not determined by population. It just is what it is. And so that way we can account for the greater good of, of the majority, but at the same time give rights to each individual state. Um, so basically, House bills, you have House bills and Senate bills. They're introduced uh, with a title. So down there, House bills are indicated by an HR, a number, and then a title. So if you're looking at a bill online and it's got an HR in front of it, that's a bill that initiated in the House. And what the difference is, is the House is more concerned uh, with bills that directly correlate with new expenditures. So if you're creating a new law and that requires some new kind of tax or fee that the government's going to impose, uh, the House is going to deal with that, where the Senate is going to deal more with just um, just the morality and, and just the, the common sense nature of the bill. Does this make sense uh, from a common sense perspective for the Senate, for the House, does it make sense fiscally? And then we can see here Senate bills are, donate, are designated by an S, a number, and then a descriptive title. So whether a bill starts in the House for, first or the Senate, um, each, each, the House and the Senate has to introduce their own version of the bill, vote on it, um, come to a joint session, work out any differences in those bills, and then at that point they have to enroll the bill, which, is mean, which means to print it, and then send it to the executive office for the president to um, you know, veto it or not. And um, yeah, so basically, Bills are mostly passed through a majority vote. There are lots of ways you can vote on bills. And um, 
here I, I wrote as an example, you would need 218 of 435 um, you know, house reps to pass a bill. That would be assuming that all the house reps were in session that day. And so it becomes complicated where um, you have to take a roll call before you have a vote. And you have to have a certain amount of people in both the House and the Senate in order to be able to hold quorum and actually take a vote. So I wanted to talk about also to wrap up with, you know, how do you actually lobby? What does the process actually look like? Like today, if you decide that you want to go to DC or Richmond and you want to speak about something to a legislator, practically speaking, what does that look like? So the first thing to do is to look up when Congress is going to be in session. So if we're talking about the federal level, then you have to figure out, okay, am I going to go see them when they're in D.C., or am I going to go see them when they're at home in your district? And uh, either way is fine. Um, so you always want to call as far in advance as you can to try to set up appointments. You're not always going to get appointments with the representative. That's okay. Sometimes their aides are actually a lot better to talk to, especially if one of their aides is a, a specific policy advisor. They might care more about that issue than the actual senator or house rep is going to vote on it. So not a bad thing necessarily if you don't get a meeting with the actual representative. And I think it's really important to figure out how big of a group do you want to take with you lobbying. Um, a lot of times for nonprofit groups, what they do is they'll have conferences in D.C., and they'll have just this train of people, you know, 20, 30 people that all want to come to the Senate, you know, or the House of Representatives buildings. And, uh, and then they all cram into a little room, you know, and generally one or two people talk. Um, I find that lobbying is most effective when you have a small group of diverse people. So if you're wondering who you should take lobbying, don't take someone that looks like you or is in the same industry as you. Like, you don't need duplicates of yourself. Show a representative example of the community so then it says to the representative wow this is an issue that's important to uh, lots of different people so i think it's really important to actually understand if you're lobbying in dc the different senate and uh, house of reps buildings there's a number of buildings um, they're confusing some of them have underground tunnels that you go through um, Sometimes you have to go back outside and go to a different building if you have a meeting with someone else. And this creates kind of a workflow issue for you if you have to go back and forth in and out of security multiple times. And so I think it's always good to study the maps of those buildings, understand um, how you can quickly get through the buildings. And because I always go lobby with small groups, a lot of times I'll see a big group of 20 people waiting for an elevator but I know that there's a staircase that goes up right next to that. And so I'll go up and squeeze a meeting in with a representative before that group even gets all their people up through the elevators. So it's important to think about those things. Um, and sometimes if you're helping to lobby for a bill that's really, really important to one of your local senators, um, sometimes you can actually borrow one of their aides and what that gets you is um, that might get you through security checkpoints easier. Um, they can sometimes set you up in different rooms a lot faster than you can do yourself. And so if you get a chance to actually borrow a legislative aid, it can be really, really helpful to speed things up. And something that I always try to do when, when I speak to um, an elected official is I always try to start the conversation by thanking them for something. So I just don't go and say, you know, I'm so-and-so, and by the way, I want you to, you know, consider this course of action. I thank them for previous items that they've already voted on, things that are already important to me. And so it just establishes good rapport. It also, I think, lets them know that um, you're not somebody that's been trying to influence legislation since yesterday. You have a history um, of being involved in this process and that you will probably have an ongoing relationship after meeting uh, the particular you know, member of Congress. So really important to frame your question, present a specific course of action, and really let them know why is it important to act now. So if such and such bill isn't passed, 
what will happen then? What's the downside as well as the upside? And I usually like to bring a small gift um, for me because I'm coming from the Kona district of Hawaii. We're known for our coffee. So everyone likes coffee, but at the same time, it makes you more memorable. Um, so if you can come up with some small gift that's unique to your geographic region, I, I think it's helpful. And then how do you include a slide? You can't talk about lobbying without talking about Jack Abramoff. Uh, so how not to get in trouble lobbying. So if you don't want to go to jail, don't do these things. Um, don't offer current people in office a better paying job for when they get out of office. So uh, don't bribe public officials by you know setting up their staff with you know vacation packages and uh, things like that. You know don't go there. We said small token gift on the last slide, less than fifty dollars. Don't go beyond that. Pay your taxes, you know, don't engage in stealth lobbying. And there's been a few articles recently about the concept of stealth lobbying. And someone that's been talked about a lot is, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich, who we're all familiar with. Um, he does what looks to be a lot of lobbying, but he says, no, I'm not lobbying, I'm providing education. It's different. Providing education on behalf of these various groups. And so a lot of people are going, well, you know, you're getting paid, you're providing education, that looks like lobbying under a definition. And a lot of people are starting to, you know, get close to getting in trouble with those issues. So, we already talked about the lobbying disclosure form. If you're those things, fill out the form, let it be known that you're a lobbyist, and, you know, don't try to claim you're not at that point. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, pay your taxes. Um, you know, don't look for loopholes, just, just keep it above board, standard stuff, and you'll be fine. So, I wanted to recommend some books and some podcasts um, that speak to lobbying, sort of why it's important, and how in the future it's going to be a lot more common for different groups to need to engage in lobbying. Um, so, The Third Wave by Steve Case is a great one. That just talks about the integration of a lot of different industries coming together, healthcare technology as well as the political process. How to pitch anything's a good one. Um, I think there's just some ideas in there to, to kind of develop your lobbying pitch and how to frame your ask uh, you know, in a much more grounded way. And uh, the new art of negotiation is a good one. But then there's two podcasts down here too that just cover the basics of how lobbying works and sort of expand on the things we've talked about today. So, with that being said, uh, does anybody have any questions? All right, well, thank you guys very much.